Right, everyone. My name is Kathy Smith. I'd like to give you a brief introduction about the library system. Every good student should learn how to use the library. If you have to do a research project, the library is the place to go to for information. Libraries contain books and periodicals, magazines and newspapers on many different subjects. To find the information you need, you must know how to use the library. All libraries are organized in much the same way. Every library houses a collection of books. Many libraries also have periodicals, films and records. All the books in a library can be classified under two main categories, fiction and non-fiction. Books of fiction contain stories that were made up by the author. Books of non-fiction contain factual material. When doing research, you use non-fiction books because you are looking for factual information. All the fictional books in a library are grouped in one section. They are arranged alphabetically by the last name of the author. Many libraries also label the spines of all books of fiction with the letters FIC or F. All libraries have a system for organizing and classifying non-fiction books. The most widely used system is the Dewey Decimal System. It was designed by an American librarian named Melvin Dewey. It is called a decimal system because it divides all non-fiction books into ten major categories. These are further divided into subdivisions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. For example, all science books are numbered from 500 through 599. Each different field of science has a number within the 500 category. For example, astronomy is 520 and chemistry is 540. The Dewey Decimal System provides a category for every type of non-fiction book. The best way to locate a book in the library is to use the card catalogue. The card catalogue is an index of all the books in the library. Information about a book is listed on cards. All the cards are filed alphabetically and stored in drawers in large cabinets. The card catalogue can help you locate a particular book, a book on a certain subject or a book by a particular author. In the card catalogue, each book has three cards, an author card, a title card and a subject card. The author card is alphabetized under the author's name. The title card is filed alphabetically according to the title of the book. The subject card is filed alphabetically under the name of the subject of the book. In many university libraries, they use their own Biblitis cataloguing system or the microfiche system. Both of them list publications under author and title, and both are very easy to use. Now, let us see the reference books. We all know that reference books make up important part of a library's non-fiction books collection. They contain facts and information about any subject you can think of. Reference books are not meant to be read from cover to cover. You should use them when you want important facts and information about a particular subject. Let's see some major types of reference books. First, dictionaries. Dictionaries are books that list and give the meanings of the words in a language. They also give the pronunciation of words in a dictionary which are listed alphabetically. Second is encyclopedias. Encyclopedias are reference books that provide factual information about people, events, places and subjects of lasting interest. Each article is written by a specialist on the topic being discussed. An encyclopedia usually consists of a number of books arranged in a set. The volumes are arranged in alphabetical order according to the topic of each article. 
Letters are stamped on the spine of each volume to indicate the alphabetical rang of the topics in each volume. For instance, if you wanted to find information about the moon, you would look in volume 8 of the encyclopedia pictured here. Next is atlases. An atlas is a book of maps. It may contain many different kinds of maps. The maps in an atlas are often arranged alphabetically by country or continent. Almanacs are also a type of reference books. An almanac is a book that contains recent statistics and summaries of information on a wide variety of topics. It is published annually. Information is listed alphabetically by subject. Indexes are alphabetical lists of names. Titles and subjects that tell where information about each can be found in other publications. For example, the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature can help you find magazine articles that have been published about a particular subject. It will give you the names of publications that have carried articles about the subject, the dates and volume numbers of the particular issue in which the articles appeared. You should be aware that reference books may not be taken out of the library under any circumstances. They are used only in the library. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello, Sue. Fancy meeting you here. It is Sue Johnson, isn't it? Oh, hi, Jill. Oh, it must be ages since we've seen each other. What a surprise. How are you? Yes, well, uh, I'm fine. I just got back from two years teaching in Hong Kong, actually. Oh, I thought you'd gone into computing or nursing. No, I ended up being a teacher after all. And how about you? Oh, fine. Things are going quite well, in fact. So, what have you been up to over the last three years? Working, studying, you know, the usual things. Oh, and I got married last year. Congratulations. Anyone I know? Yeah, you might remember him from our college days. Uh, do you remember Jerry? Jerry Fox? Jerry? Was he the one with the dark hair and beard? No, that was Sam. No, Jerry's got blonde hair and glasses. He's pretty tall. Well, we got married, finally. Great. And where did the wedding take place? Was it here in London? No, in the end, we decided to get married in Scotland. Jerry's parents lived there, so we were married in the small village church with the mountains in the background. Fabulous. Have you got any pictures? Well, funny you should ask. I have actually got a couple here. They're a bit battered because I've been carrying them around in my bag. <laughs> oh, never mind. Let's have a look. Oh, don't you look wonderful. Who are those people behind you? Oh, that's my older sister, Clara. Oh, she looks like you. Do you think so? Everyone says that, but we can't see it. Is she married now? Yes, and she's got three children, a girl and twin boys as well. Wow, imagine having twins. Look, why don't we have dinner together and catch up on a few things? Would you like to come over one evening? Oh, that'd be lovely. What about next Friday evening? 
Fine. What time? Shall I come over about eight o'clock? Oh, come about half past seven. I'm usually home around six thirty, so that'd give me plenty of time to get dinner ready. Oh, fine. And、um, one last thing: where do you live? What's the address? <laughs> oh, good thinking. Here's my card. The address is on the back. We've got a flat in an old house. We live on the third floor of a large old house. The house has been converted into flats. So when you arrive, you'll need to press the bell second from the top.、Uh, the bell second from the top. Okay. There's a little intercom arrangement, so I can let you in. Right. Okay. See you on Friday then. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. Welcome, Jill. This is my husband, Jerry. Jerry, this is Jill. Hi, Jill. Nice to meet you.、Uh, hi, Jerry. Well, let's come in and take a seat. Sue told me that you've just returned from Hong Kong.、Uh, was it a pleasant trip? What kind of city is it? Oh well, Hong Kong enjoys a reputation for the flourishing business. It has a population of around six point six million, much larger than that of Sydney, right? Sydney has a population of four million, I think. Yes.、Uh, did you enjoy staying there? Well, being a metropolis has advantages. You get the latest films and music. There's always something going on, and there's such a wide variety of different people and cultures that it's difficult to get bored. Of course, all this has its downside. The cost of living is very expensive, and most people cannot afford to go out very often. So, although the entertainment is available, you have to have a lot of money to enjoy it. Another problem is, like most big cities, there's a lot of crime. What about the weather? I suppose that it gets a lot of rain. Well, not always. In summer, it's humid, but it's cool and dry in winter. The average temperature in June and July is about ninety-one degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than here. The best seasons are spring and autumn. They are mild and agreeable. Is there anything you particularly miss of staying there? Yes, the tasty local food is to my liking, especially the seafood. Hong Kong also enjoys the fame of a paradise for shopping, but I'm not very keen on that. You know, I suppose it must be your favourite. Most shopping malls in Hong Kong have longer opening hours than those in Sydney. Some are even open the whole night during the Christmas holidays. Oh, it sounds lovely! I hope I have a chance to travel there, and I can be your tour guide. Yes, that's great. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between Caesar and a welfare officer. As you listen, answer questions eleven to twenty.
First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Good afternoon. My name's Cesar Bautisto. Hello, I'm Wendy, one of the welfare officers. Can I help you? Yes. I have to move out of my accommodation in two weeks, and I can't find anywhere else to live. OK. I'll need to know some details about your current situation. I'm an overseas student from the Philippines. The college gave me a temporary room for one month. I can't find anywhere else, and I have no money. Have you told the college about your position, or asked them to let you stay longer in your accommodation? No, not yet. I, I didn't think that would be possible. Well, we can contact the accommodation service on your behalf to see if they'll let you stay a little longer, until you can find an alternative. Thank you. But I'm not sure that I can find another place, as they all ask for money before moving in, and I don't have any. Yes, it is usual in this country for landlords to ask for up to a month's rent in advance. Don't you have any money at all? Hardly any. I'm waiting for my grant cheque to be sent from the Philippines at the moment. It should have been here for me to collect when I arrived in Britain, but it seems to have been lost. You can apply for emergency loan from the union if you want. The loan can be for up to £200, and we ask for a post-dated cheque for the same amount to be given to us so that we can recover the money once you receive your grant cheque. That would be very good. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'll apply, but I'm still worried about how to find new accommodation. As I said earlier, we can ask the college to extend the time you're allowed to stay in your present accommodation. They may refuse, of course. Then what will happen? If the worst comes to the worst, the union may be able to provide some very short-term emergency accommodation. If you want me to, I'll contact one or two of the addresses on the notice board and arrange for you to visit them. But what if they ask me for the rent in advance? I only have £90 left and I need that for food and books. It'll be all right. By the time they actually need the money, we'll have your emergency loan ready. Just fill in this application form and write me a cheque for £200, please. Payable to the student union. Right, I'll do that. Thank you very much for your help. I'm feeling more optimistic now. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You're going to hear a talk about the English policeman. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The English policeman has several nicknames, but the most frequently used are Copper and Bobby. The first name comes from the verb to cop, which is also slang, meaning to take or to capture. And the second comes from the first name of Sir Robert Peel, the 19th century politician who was the founder of the police force as we know it today. An early nickname for the policeman was Peeler, but this one has died out. Whatever we may call them, the general opinion of the police seems to be a favourable one, except, of course, among the criminal part of the community, where the police are given more derogatory nicknames, which originated in America, such as Fuzz or Pig. Visitors to England seem nearly always to be very impressed by the English police. It has, in fact, become a standing joke that the visitor to Britain, when asked for his views of the country, will always say, at some point or other, I think your policemen are wonderful. Well, the British Bobby may not always be wonderful, but he is usually a very friendly and helpful sort of character. A music hall song of some years ago was called If You Want to Know the Time, Ask a Policeman. Nowadays, most people own watches, but they still seem to find plenty of other questions to ask the policeman. In London, the policemen spend so much of their time directing visitors about the city that one wonders how they ever find time to do anything else. Two things are immediately noticeable to the stranger when he sees an English policeman for the first time. The first is that he does not carry a pistol and the second is that he wears a very distinctive type of headgear, the policeman's helmet. His helmet, together with his height, enables an English policeman to be seen from a considerable distance, a fact that is not without its usefulness. From time to time it is suggested that the policeman should be given a pistol and that his helmet should be taken from him. But both these suggestions are resisted by the majority of the public and the police themselves. However, the police have not resisted all changes. Radios, police cars and even helicopters give them greater mobility now. The policeman's lot is not an enviable one, even in a country which prides itself on being reasonably law-abiding. But, on the whole, the English policeman fulfils his often thankless task with courtesy and good humour and with an understanding of the fundamental fact that the police are the country's servants and not its masters. That is the end of part four.